everyone, um, my name is Noor Fahmi and I'm part of the steering committee here at ACE. Um, ACE is a community of machine learning practitioners and researchers who have gathered around topics in AI research, engineering, and products. We host free live sessions like this three to five times a week and produce premium content in various subject areas. To see more, visit um, ai.science and log in to access slides from this and other sessions and many more. Also make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel, ML Papers Explained, to get notified about all the future live sessions and other content we publish. And if you like this talk as well, don't forget to smash that like button. And we currently have 14 streams that are focused on various ML topics, and the session is in um, the mathematical stream. We hope you enjoyed it and come back. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker today. His name is Professor Ernest from Rochester Institute of Technology, where he teaches statistical learning. Hello, Noor. Good morning, and uh, thank you. Thank you uh, for inviting me. I, uh, I have to say that the initiative that you just announced and this uh, AI.science is something that I've enjoyed a lot. I think I went and searched some of the things that you guys have done, and I think this is a beautiful initiative where you are helping people um, enter and really uh, comprehend some of the most uh, beautiful uh, state-of-the-art things in uh, in uh, statistical machine learning. It's a beautiful field, and uh, artificial intelligence is here to stay. It is a discipline of the 21st century. And um, like I said, I, I'm very grateful to be here. And uh, like I said last time, I dedicate this talk to my dad. I really, I mean, this man taught me so many things. And I, uh, if I can do anything right now, it's because of all the uh, great, great advice and the love that he gave me. So I'm very proud of you, dad. Thank you. And I know he's watching from somewhere. So uh, anyway, um, Dad taught me so many things, including this very beautiful uh, talk about integrity. So I'm going to share my little knowledge today with uh, as much in integrity as I can muster. But I want to thank Nora again because she's the one who started this for me. She, uh, she saw my paper and wanted me to come and talk about it to the audience, to you guys. And uh, I think gratitude is the greatest force in the universe. So I want to express my gratitude to Noor. I want to express my gratitude to um, Aggregate Intellect and because I think they're doing a phenomenal job. Okay. So I think I already went through some of this last time. Some of you may be seeing this for the first time, but uh, if you saw the first sequel to this, it was supposed to be an hour, but I lost track of time. <laughs> Forgive me for that. And, uh, but I just wanted to make, frankly, some disclaimers that this talk is not intended for sophisticated, advanced people in machine learning. It is intended to be very introductory and didactic, uh, just to give people a flavor of what it is that machine learning people do. And I, uh, I, I decided to, um, I decided to organize it into what I call the seven wheels of uh, statistical machine learning of which I managed to explore a couple of weeks last time, but just by way of helping people have a good framework of what it is I'm talking about, uh, I'm gonna go over wheel one, two, all the way to wheel seven and explaining what it is I believe is the process that tends to go on over and over again when people are involved in an activity dealing with statistical machine learning. And, uh, and I, you will see that at the end, I'll be making a claim that you cannot truly do theory without application and you cannot do application without theory there should be a, a beautiful interplay between the two and um so without further ado last time i mentioned the seven wheels of statistical machine learning the first wheel was what i call data that in in a sense whenever you involve in an artificially intelligent process or a machine learning process to talk about the the, the machinery of it all uh, usually the starting point is some data. Now, in this particular case, I'm showing uh, supervised learning context because I have an X and a Y. But you can imagine a non-supervised learning context, but you can also imagine the context of reinforcement learning. But in all those cases, there's data coming, sometimes in a batch format, sometimes in a sequential format, but there's data. And one of the things that you want to know right away when you see data, it triggers ideas to you. If you want to know something about it, like uh, what kind of informal insights, you know, uh, can you gather for the phenomenon that the data is apparently depicting? And uh, like distributions and uh, all the five V's of data, including variety, volume, velocity, and uh, validity. So the first wheel then is data. What is the data telling you? That's where you enter. The first thing that you see is the data. The second wheel 
is something I call function spaces and hypothesis spaces. And we're going to see that when I get into the details of this very quickly. Is like when you see the data and you explore it, like you generate scatter plots or pairwise box plots or inspection of columns and rows or any other XGOBI on all kinds of things that you use to perform exploratory data analysis. It usually suggests sometimes some hypothesis space, some abstract mathematical way of representing the phenomenon that you're trying to construct. Like for instance, in supervised learning, you're basically trying to map objects from the input space to object of the output space. And you want to go from the data to an abstraction of it, like something you saw in your linear regression, that you saw a scatter, a scatter plot, but you could see that the scatter plot was always very, very dense around something that will end up being called the least square regression line. Okay, that's the idea that the data may suggest ideas of the hypothesis of the abstraction, the machine that is producing this uh, observation. So that's wheel number two, okay? Wheel number one, data. Wheel number two, function spaces or hypothesis spaces, as they call them. But in wheel number three, you're saying, okay, now that I have this idea, how do I then go into this hypothesis space and search for the member that best captures the phenomenon at hand. And that's where the concept of learning really starts. Learning here as the minimization of an expected loss. This is one of the things that we inherited from decision theory, that I saw the data, I hypothesized something, I'm going to build a system, a mechanism, a criteria, a criterion for searching within the space of models to find the good candidate. But usually you may even start from the vast space of all possible models, although you will see very quickly later that you keep having to go back to this space H because you can't search the entirety of the function space. It's incredibly onerous and it's not easy. We're gonna see more about that later. So that wheel number three, right? Data, function space, and strategy for moving around that function space to find a good member. But in this case, in step number three, you're still in what we call the theoretical. You still have a theoretical definition there because these are expected value that usually you don't have in practice. So what you do then is you go from that to the definition of the so-called an empirical risk. So the theoretical risk now has a counterpart from the empirical, empirical standing for you have data now and you have data, and then you're gonna take that expected value and compute the empirical version of it from the data. And this is usually what you have. So by the time you get to this point, you have a function space in the case where you're minimizing uh, something in a function space. We're gonna see not all, not all learning machines are defined by this way. There's some learning machines that are defined in different ways, but in this, in this framework, of there being a loss function that you can optimize in order to get your uh, machine, this is what you end up doing. You end up searching using the empirical risk, a member of that class. But then a lot of stuff start happening then. When you enter that universe, what happens, you start having to contend with the fact that this guy is a random variable or random function, if you prefer to call it that way. And the very fact of searching for him involves something called the computational complexity. And, uh, and you also have some statistical properties like the bias. How far is this guy that I just found from the ideal, which, which we're going to define in a minute, and so this is a wheel number four. So you're marching. So you're going to sense as I finish this that there is a sense of sequentiality in the wheels as I define them. That frankly, you could perturb the order if you want, but in reality, it seems to flow better if you think of it in that sequence. And then finally, when you construct this after realizing all the difficulties that may arise when you start looking at the property, is the algorithm converging? How complex is it? What is the variance of this estimator? What's the bias of it? These are all statistical properties that you inherited from your basic statistical learning. And we're going to realize that, in fact, it turns out that this very interesting result underneath here in the case of regression it gives us an idea of really one of the most fundam fundamental results in statistical machine learning. Okay, that's wheel number four, the actual construction of the learning machines. That's why you evoke your things like, you know, uh, stochastic gradient descent, uh, Newton Raphson, all kinds of algorithms you've heard of, you know, back propagation. Those are all intended to find this random variable, the random function to extract this member. But finally, it becomes clear quickly in step number four that is 
very, very, very common that step number four is not the end of the story. And the reason is because of this thing called the ill poseness, or rather the well poseness that I talked to you about last time, the Harama. Harama came up with this recommendation, this you know, taxonomy of what it called, the definition of what he called a well posed problem. And which I think is intuitively appealing to me in a sense that he says, if you want to truly solve a problem, you better pose it very well. What does that mean? That the problem you're trying to solve has a solution. Now, if somebody tells you to solve a problem and there's no solution, well, uh, that's terrible. I mean, you're asking me to look for something that's not there. So there has to be a solution, right? There has to be a solution. Like if you're searching x squared plus one equals zero in the set of real numbers, good luck. You're not gonna find anything in that because according to the algebra that defines the set of real numbers, x squared plus one equals zero, uh, mm, there's no x in the set of real numbers that really verifies that property. So you need to define a, a, a problem such that the solution exists. The solution is unique because you say, I'm looking for the solution. It must be unique somewhere and the solution must be stable. It turns out that what we saw in step number four, because of this thing that we're gonna call bias variance trade-off, you can construct machines that violate immediately the rule number three of well posedness the stability, that by perturbing that solution a little bit, things change a lot. That's called high variance. The machines with extremely high variance will turn out to violate step number three, where you are looking for the machine that minimizes the true error, the true risk. That true risk, is what we're gonna call it generalization error. And you're gonna be looking for machines that minimize that true risk, which is gonna be one of the hardest problems to do. Then step number five is gonna help you combine the steps from number four to stabilize and find in those shaky systems some members that truly help you not just minimize this guy, but minimize this guy on your way to minimizing his big brother, which is R without the hat. And that's where we introduce so many things like, uh, you know, regularization, selection, compression, and certainly model averaging. So we're going to see sometimes that there will be a multiplicity of solution, which is the violation of rule number two. It's not unique. But many of the candidates may turn out to be decent candidates. I always call them I always call them probable models, you know, so good candidate, they're plausible candidate models. And that's where you may have to, you know, combine them together. So that's step number five. And step number six is the practical aspect of the so-called predictive analytics. Because in reality, what you want is that after you select the model in a class, you actually want it to be able to perform well on data that you never saw during your training, during the construction of F hat you saw some data sets. If you calculate the error on them, that error would tend to be smaller than the error on the things that were not seen before. A little bit like if you train for soccer with your friends and after that you go play in a city next door, you may get shocked because maybe they're better than you never saw that. You never saw some aspect of soccer that they know that you did not know, okay? And so that's the idea of the splitting of the data into training and test set, which is the basics, right? And the reason why we do that is because we want to have an empirical measure of the true error. We want to have an empirical measure of R. What we care so much about is not R hat, but we want R. And because we don't have that expected value, since we don't have the distribution, we have to go back and mimic it. We mimic it the same way that we mimic it in step number five. We mimic having those. One of the reasons why this is so true is because of something called the no free lunch theorem. And we're going to see that in a minute that, in fact, given one single problem, because of the ingenuity of people like yourself watching me today, you're going to have the idea of an algorithm that's different from my algorithm, that's different from somebody else's algorithm, different from Noor's algorithm, different from Amir's algorithm. So we're going to have a multiplicity of approaches to solving the same problem. And it turns out that one of the best ways to do it is what I call it the extrinsic comparison. So you're comparing outside of script H. So you can imagine many different function spaces, each one of them building their best, like the best neural network against the best support vector machine, against the best trees and so on. Each one of them optimizes in class. And now they go to the party, like at the Olympic and say, okay, now you optimize in your country, you optimize in your city. Let's now go there in a neutral space and see how you play. So that's what I call the extrinsic comparison. This is the empirical version of it. And finally, the seven wheel. Is the wheel that somebody may think I should have introduced earlier. What is this wheel really about? This wheel is talking about two things. 
What happens inside your class? And what happens with respect to the best of the best? This guy called the best of the best is the smallest possible error that you can make. Now, you can define that error theoretically for the vast majority of well-known loss functions, but you cannot realize it. But at least theoretically, you may be fortunate to find some bounds or some expression of the relationship between what it is you just did in the function space H and what happens with R star. What really is R star is the best in the universe. We call it the universal best. That function F star is a universal best and its error is R star, which is the smallest possible realizable error. Usually we call it the base risk for reasons that will become obvious in a minute. Okay, so this is my little review of what it is that I said last time. So these are the seven wheels of statistical machine learning as seen by me. Again, this is my taxonomy and um, many people may have different taxonomy, many different ways of viewing this universe of statistical machine learning, but this is the way I experience it. This is the way I communicate it. And I can see myself literally in every single activity involving statistical machine learning, traversing this landscape traversing this landscape from the top to the bottom. And um, and like I said last time, I don't want people to really think that this theoretical part is useless because it's theoretical. What it does, even though sometimes this bounds, you know, sometimes you'll hear me say these bounds are loose. Even though this bounds may be loose sometime in the sense of um, the concept of uh, a confidence interval with, that is very wide. If these bounds are loose, but they still give you an idea to think about them, the fact, the activity of thinking about them allows you to get more acquainted with your problem. Okay, this is a slight quick overview. And uh, I think um, this is a slight quick overview of um, of this um, seven wheels of statistical machine learning. I wonder if this generates some question or if this might be a good place for some people to ask some questions about it before I start uh, stumping. Because the first one, I'm going to go real fast in the wheel number one because I already spent a lot of time there. But Nora, if you, if there's anyone, if you're receiving some questions right now that I can entertain, I'll be glad to do that right now in my first, uh, in my first fly over the seven wheels of statistical machine learning as I see them. So totally. I didn't. Uh so I think the first question would be, um, do you distinguish between error and risk? Do I distinguish between? Uh, error and risk. Oh, between error and risk. Oh, that's a very good question. I mean, that might be a question of, voc of vocabulary, right? Because, in fact, I was teaching a class recently about risk analysis, right? So the, the, the risk analysis. In fact, it's very difficult to disentangle them sometime, right? Because risk is always relative to something that you wish to realize right risk the risk of being hurt the risk of not being chosen the risk of this so there is a desired outcome in this case the desired outcome is y and then we're using f of x to determine it to predict it and we're saying we're calling the loss y f of x as the risk of not getting the why that we wanted. So the, the bigger it is, the risk we are to be away from what it is that we try to predict. In that sense, the risk and the error very much are the same thing because it's the error in your prediction, right? The, in that sense, the, so the risk is relative to something that you are losing, right? So you, the risk of being hurt, the risk of this, the risk of not getting what you wanted, the risk of an illness. So if you can find a way to guard from it, you're measuring how risky it is. So that the bigger the loss function, the bigger the loss value, then the higher the risk, which in this case is the expected loss. So the expected error, the expected discrepancy. So risk is just discrepancy between what you want it and what is trying to predict it. In that sense, the, 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 the identical. They mean the same thing in that context. Awesome. Cool. Um, I don't believe we have any other. No questions so far. Yeah. Mm hmm. Oh, Heidi. Okay, that's right. <laughs> yes, I, I didn't know what to do with it for a while. Thank you for telling me. So, all right then. So let's go into this, right? Because, like I say, this last. 
this honestly, this last wheel, the number seven, really is so rich because that's where you talk about generalization. That's really what gives statistics its great power. Although people think of statistics always in a descriptive sense, but statistics became so powerful as a subject because of inference, because of its ability to quantify the uncertainty. So this quantity F hat n, this function because it's constructed from a random sample, has uncertainty. So we have to quantify it somehow. And that's where we use this, these are probabilistic bounds. So with a probability one minus eta, the risk that you really want to calculate the error, the generation error is bounded above by this quantity. So, okay, now this is a part that everyone relates to. Wheel number one, the data. When you start any process, what you want, I mean, frankly, I tell people, if you don't look at the data and you just go ahead and download something and start running code and stuff like that, you, you, you're wrong. You got to look at the data. You can explore it, show me the data, and let's have a deeper and closer look at it. So I like what Deming said, in God we trust, all others must bring data. So, so, so you can't just come and tell me this is true always. Say, well, what is the empirical evidence? That, that's what data is, but that's what the empirical, what's the experimental empirical evidence in what Deming is saying is that, yeah, well, for those who are believers, those who are religious people, you can go ahead and trust in God. But for us humans, come on, tell me something. What is your data? Show me the data. Show me clearly the data. So... And uh, without data, you are just another person with an opinion. That's true. Yeah, so you tell me something, you give me the empirical evidence. And the empirical evidence comes from, you know, the, the, the basic statistics that you calculated, the estimators you calculated, along with inference, along with inference, an aspect of um, or generalization over the whole population. And then so you encounter data like, you know, you have MNIST, CIFRA, self-driving cars and text mining with, you know, topic modeling and credit scoring, disease diagnosis and all kinds of data. But when the data comes to you, the first thing you want to do is you want to gain insights into the distributional aspects of the data. You want to look at the data. First of all, you look at the data. When the data comes, you say, what does it look like? What is it? What is the dimensionality of it? How many rows does it have if it's a static data? And how many columns does it have? How, what is the dimensionality of it? So you're getting into the so-called informal insights. I can tell you this thing. This is one of the most fun thing a data scientist does to explore his data, his or her data, to look at it from all kinds of angles, using all kinds of plots. Like, okay, this is a seven dimensional problem of classification, the well-known Pima Indian diabetes data that I've used at nauseum until now. People, many of my students are probably sick of me for using this data a lot. And I like it because it's not simple. It's very hard data set in a sense that the, the, the expected accuracy uh, is, is, is pretty, is not as high as you would expect it to be. Or an even simpler data set, the famous banana, the famous banana um, shape data set here, which is a 2D data set. And you're trying to construct a system for, uh, for, uh, performing classification of points that come like that. But one thing that you see is that one of the most fascinating things that happened to data science recently is the so-called concept of the relationship between N and P, N being the number of observation and P be the, the dimension of the input space. And it turns out that when N is larger than P, we go back to classical statistics, right? So we have, we go back to a system, we call that an overdetermined system. And uh, you, know, you can use the, 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 the system the majority of algorithms are somewhat comfortable with it, provided you don't have some problems like, uh, you know, multicollinearity and some of the difficulties. So, but in a sense, when n is greater than p, life is good. But when in, when n is less than p, this has opened a massive open door. And I hope some of you guys will be working in this underdetermined system where, you know, so many machines, a Danzig selector uh, of, uh, of, um, of, um, uh, Terence Tao and uh, Emmanuel Candace, it's a very beautiful machine. The Lasso works on this. And, and there the, are so many systems that works on this system. I remember the first time I mentioned this kind of problem to one of my friends, he said, do you even solve problem like that if N is less than P? I said, oh yeah. Statisticians have come up with so many ways to solve this kind of problem. So this is what happens at the data stage. You're looking at this to normalize your variables, what's happening, and you're looking at the shape of your uh, data matrix or your design matrix in case you were thinking of it as coming from a design experiment. And so you want to acquaint yourself with this, you know, and then you go as far as recognizing that these are always random samples. Right, so so the data. So you're getting acquainted with it because this is your first window. This is your first foray into how you're going to construct the machine. And some of the things that you tend to do is start looking at distributional. You look at this and say, hmm, 
what is the range of each of the variables? So you see some variables are measured on different scales. It may be suggesting that you have to scale it, like some many neural networks, many theorems, like the universal approximation theorem assumes that all the x's are coming from some interval zero, one. Maybe you should cubitize, as I've come to call it, put it in the unit cube uh, of degree of, um, of uh, order p, and, uh, or you can, if you're performing classification, you can start, it's a binary classification. You start looking at, mm, is there a way that I can use a simple linear classifier to separate? Like when I'm constructing trees, I tend to do this pairwise kind of plots a lot. So I'm still playing with the wheel number one, exploring what's possible. I'm looking at the pairwise variables. You know, can I use number of pregnancy and glucose to get a, feel for the kind of decision boundary I have. This case is telling us, oh, maybe not. This data set is really nasty. There's nothing that's coming out clean and nice. So it might well be that you're gonna need some pretty sophisticated machine in this case, right? You may you may plot this pairwise scatter plot in classification and see clearly that linear machines will work for you because many of them, many pairwise variables are separating things very nicely or that here single variables were already doing a good job. So. This is step number one, my friend. This is wheel number one, a time you spend. Some people even consider wheel number one the place where you do data cleaning and uh, you know ascertaining that the data is correct, the missing values and all those things. You acquaint yourself with the data. But a lot of times, by the time you end there, things like this pairwise scatter plot and other things, they may start to give you a sense of the kind of script H that you might be entertaining. It may not be a complete view though, don't get me wrong. A lot of time the construction of script H, the function space may come from your experience or from the physical understanding of the data. Maybe as a physicist or a marketing person, you have a sense that this can never be linear or this will be linear with some little transformation. So. We have a question from Ziad. Yes, please, please uh, go ahead. Ziad's asking um, in which wheel should feature engineering lie? Uh, in which in which wheel should we do what? I should feature engineering lie. Oh, it's uh, it starts from wheel number one, right? Wheel number one, but it comes back later. Though I'm going to tell you when you go to wheel number five, you might go because this is like an engineering system, right? You you will go back. Sometimes you have to loop back in. That's a beautiful question. I like that question a lot. This is preliminary, right, Noah? In this case, you're just getting acquainted with the data. I call it. I call it informal. So it's an informal inspection. See, initial informal inspection. So it's informal. But then after you choose a model, you will refine it. That's why I believe step number five is one of the most crucial. The feature engineering, you may go back and decide you need more features or decide you need to change in a certain way. So yeah, you start your first four rays into feature engineering from step number one, where you get acquainted with it before you even consider doing anything like uh, PCA or some other forms of compression of the data or definition of new features or adding of the, the so-called um, interaction variables and stuff like that. Yeah, this is the first place you do it, but this is not the only place you do feature engineering, my friend. You may have to do it again in step number five and go back in. Um, Professor, for the sake of time, do you want to pick up where we left off in the beginning of row five? Yeah. Yes. I think you've done a great job reviewing the wheels. Oh, right. Uh, yeah. Okay. So this is where, this is the wheel that I needed to finish for you guys. So this is where we stopped last time. And where we were constructing machines, I was trying to draw your attention on the fact that machines come in different ways, right? There's different types of machines. Like some of them are constructed the way you saw earlier, you know, same reality, different views and different systems for constructing it. Now, some machines you will construct them by just your intuition. Like the key nearest neighbor, you're not really minimizing any risk. You're not doing anything specific. You just, it's a nice intuition whereby you think this is a reasonable to do it, and it turns out to be a very good machine. Okay, this is good, but this is called an implicit approximation. You can do an explicit approximation whereby you have a loss function and you're minimizing that loss function within the function space. This is what you do with Gaussian processes, neural network, logistic regression, and support vector machine. Or, um, or you can do just some direct optimization here. This is this is pretty complex. When you do linear discriminant analysis, is when you're trying to find f star directly. 
you know, like you say, you let's assume that the data is Gaussian, and then you can do that. You can you can uh, use that to get to get your estimation of the function. Okay, now in that step, then what happens is that you construct machines, some of them by minimizing the empirical risk. And what I was trying to bring your attention on is that when you minimize the empirical risk, one thing that first happens is this point here. You construct this f hat. But immediately, this is probably the most consequential slide in this segment. Immediately, what happens is that you have to contend with this thing called bias, which is the distance between the expected value of your function, which is a random variable. This is a this is a pointwise bias. I mean, we're not going to get into the different difference between pointwise and um, and um, and the uniform. But and so you have a bias and you have a variance, and there's a temptation. When you are, when your goal is to minimize this risk, to just find something that fits extremely well, and this is something that anyone in this lecture probably knows very well. So you, you have a risk that you can minimize too well, and that's what I call minimization gone wild. One of the extremes you can do is just to memorize it. If you memorize it like you, what you do with one nearest neighbor, if you memorize it with one nearest neighbor, so what happens is that you're going to have a zero error, but that zero error could be hiding a big disaster for you because of this concept in statistics known as you know the interplay so ideally you would want to have an mvue the minimum variance on bias estimator but a lot of time in real problem especially in function estimation that's not what you will get if you try to minimize your bias too much then your variance goes up and vice versa and that's what we call bias variance dilemma so the bias variance dilemma is one of the central issues in machine learning, which is captured in what I call the central picture, right? In the central picture, you see that in step number four, you are noticing quickly that unless you do something, you're going to be in trouble on the side or you're going to be trouble on that side. So what you're trying to do then is to go quickly to step number five, where you can find a way to find the machine that is still good enough in terms of fitting, but at the same time, give you the promise of giving the true error because this is the guy you can this this guy here the test error is the best estimate of the true error and you want that test error to be small so and it's only small if you are somewhere in a compromise the so-called trade-off between bias and variance so that's 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 the that's the tenant of step number four Forward, that you're building this machine, you have to be conscious of computational complexity, you have to put up with the fact that sometimes the solution may not even come out because your problem is ill-defined, like when you have multicollinearity and regression, you may not even be able to invert X transpose X and things like that. You have to contend with that in step number four. And when you become aware of that in step number four, you, be, you may become aware of it because the code just crashed or because you realize that every attempt to predict was giving you a prediction error that was larger than anyone else who worked on the same problem. You're like, what happened to me? Well, maybe you became too happy and you start making this function way too complex. And that's what happened. And that's where you would come to step number five, the refinement, the wheel number five. Somebody was asking the question, where do you do feature engineering? In fact, step number one is a place where you do feature engineering, but step number uh, step number five is one of the places where you revisit it, even though you encountered it already in step one. Okay, we, so yes, yes, ma'am. Can we, re <laughs> Hi, professor. Um, can we refresh um, really quickly what the definitions of bias and variance means? Yes, so let, let, in let, the context let, of um, model accuracy. Yeah, in, in terms of model, that's very good. Okay, let, let's go back here, right? So the, the idea here in the, in the idea of bias is that the idea of bias is actually very, it's a very beautiful idea, Noor, because what it says is you are trying to measure something, right? Like in function, in even in parameter estimation, you're trying to measure something. If you consistently over measure it or consistently under measure it, then something is wrong. You want it to be such that in the presence of many different samples, you are moving up and down in the error realm. It, it's, it looks something like this. Um, oh, I, that's a nice question. I wish I had drawn the graph. It's almost like this expected value is telling us if you have seen everything, what's the difference between the expected value of this random variable and the true function that you're trying to estimate? If this number is not zero, if, for instance, if this number is positive, what it means is that at point x, you're consistently overestimating the value 
If this number is negative, it means that you're consistently underestimating the value. Think of it as you have a normal curve and there is the center there that is expected value of theta hat. But then that expected value of theta hat is not the center, it's somewhere off. So it means that you are, it, it's not, it's not, it's not perfectly lined up with theta. If that expected value of theta is not lined up with theta, it means that your process is going somewhere else. Like maybe the sad example is that imagine you go to a butcher and he's a dishonest. So he puts some stuff to always charge you more than you should normally be paying. They say that the guy doctored the scale. So he's always, he's always overestimating your real weight so that he charges you more. And so, so in, in function estimation, that is what we call bias. And, and what would it be like in regression? Let me tell you that in regression. For instance, in regression, if I have a quadratic function and you're using a linear function to measure, to, to estimate it, then what happens is that you're using something simpler. So you're always on the left side of it. So, 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 so that area, you're always on the left side. But if you're using a cubic, you're always on the right side, you're overestimating. You under, so, but if you go and find the real P to be two, then it means that you have now zero in on the real complexity of that function. Th does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So um, that's the bias. The bias is the bias is the measure of how far the expected value of that random variable, which is your machine is a random variable. Let's not forget it. Your machine, like I said here in this slide, all the things that we're dealing, this is, this is, I'm just moving so fast to show you all this thing that we're doing, the, all the starting point, the reason why this is statistical machine learning is because your machine you build is a random variable. So you have to be careful with the variance of it and careful with the bias of it. So if you use a machine that is weaker, like if you use a linear, when the true machine is quadratic, then you, you are on the left side. If you use a cubic, when the thing is quadratic, then you're on the right hand side of it. So you want to really find the guy that is there in the middle. Yeah, that's expected value. So, and so that's, that's what we're saying here that this picture, honestly, it's for lack of a better term, it's one of the pictures that summarizes the, everything that we do in statistical learning, because we're looking to minimize the true error whose best estimate is the test error in this particular case. So we see here. So if your machine is too simple, then you are, you know, have high bias. So you have a high bias and so if your machine is too complex, then you have a low bias because your bias is now getting close to zero, right? So it's getting, so it's fitting perfectly, but it's coming at the expense of high variance. And that's something that's not, yes, I'm here. Low or high variance. Say that again. What does it mean to have either low or high variance? What does it mean to have a low or high variance? Very good. To have a low variance, I'm gonna explain that to you in a very simple, if your function is constant, like if you're using k nearest neighbors and you use n neighbors all the time, your function will just be a constant. The variance of that function will be zero, but that function is hopelessly terrible because it's always predicting the same thing. So if you're using k nearest neighbors, right? And k nearest neighbors, very beautiful machine to explain this concept really. If you're using k nearest neighbor and you make your number of neighbors equal to n, then he will always predict a constant. Like in regression, it will always be y bar. F, F of xi will be y bar regardless of xi. That machine, Nor, has zero variance. It doesn't vary because it's constant. The variance of a constant is zero. But the bias of that machine is deadly because <laughs> he doesn't even know what's happening. He's only, you say, what is the prediction for five? He says seven. What's the prediction for 25? Seven. What's the prediction for the seven? He keeps saying the same thing. So he never varies. That is the concept of a zero. That's the extreme of a zero variance. The extreme of a zero bias is the guy that is always fitting perfectly, right? Like one and and one nearest neighbor, whose VC dimension is infinite, by the way, one nearest neighbor, he's always predicting f of xi equal yi, f of xi equal yi, f of xi equal yi. So he, he makes zero error. He doesn't make any error. He fits perfectly the data that you gave him, but he doesn't learn the function either because the function may be quadratic, but he's always putting a very complex, very complex decision boundary as you'll see in a minute. So that function also is not a good thing. So I don't, so these are two, I'm, I'm giving two extremes of zero by yes on one hand and the extreme of zero variance on the other. And what you want is a function that's somewhere in the middle, a function that's not just learning the noise or a function that is not just sitting there constant. I'm not gonna do any work. My answer is always seven. My answer is always seven. 
My answer is always seven. So if a function does that, then you don't want that function either. And it, this is really, you're trying to learn to adapt to what it is that is underlying. So you're trying to separate the signal from the noise. That's why I said last time, you could almost think of this if you're a signal processing expert as a signal to noise separation, signal to noise ratio. So you want to be able to go and pick up that signal in the middle of noise. I don't know if that helps a little bit with this bias invariance. What does it mean high bias and what does it mean uh, high variance? Does that help a little bit, No. Totally, and that was a great example. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, one Ken nearest neighbor, I'm gonna tell you this, Nor, is a very powerful, it's a very interesting machine to explain this concept because it's simple to imagine, but it also brings this concept to life very nicely. In fact, when we enter step number five, refinement, that's where we encounter ways to take care of those anomalies, to take care of those minimization gone wild, like I call it. When the minimization start to go wild, what you wanna do is just something called regularization. Huh? regularization. You want to be telling the person, hey, listen, it's not just about having a zero error, buddy. It's about having an error that's small, but that also learns the function, right? And that's where the idea of a regularization comes in. So you, you, you try to control, you try to penalize him. So he's trying to get this guy to be too small. He said, no, no, no. It's not a matter of getting that, this guy small. It's a matter of finding the function underlying those noisy points. And that's what regularization does, okay? And regularization in its general form has this. And one of the things that you will see, one of the tools that we use a lot, this is almost like a universal tool in step number five, is this thing called cross-validation. And what it basically just does, it says the reason why that machine is tending to go to zero bias is because he thinks that I want the error to be zero. And the reason why he thinks that is because if I'm just counting on the members of the training set, it's easy for me to bring the error to zero just by memorizing. So what we're going to do, we're going to create a system where we'll mimic the true error. We'll mimic the generalization by putting aside a portion of the data and then, and pushing aside a portion of data and then predicting on it. So we're, gonna, we're not going to measure you by the way that you learn, but by the way that you did the exam if that makes sense. So we're going to measure you on something that you did not see before. And that's precisely what this guy does. What he does is that it, it allows you to mimic the prediction by saying, let's build you and find the number of neighbors based not on just the guy that we're seeing, but the guys that were never seen. So that you set that guy aside. The oldest one is called leave one as cross validation, but there's a general version of it called the V4 cross validation, where you leave a chunk of the data, you divide the data into V chunks, and indeed you use you set aside the, the the one of the chunks and train using the remainder and predict. So you measure him based on this estimate estimator of the true error. So this error becomes more reasonable. All right, it mimics this. In fact, that's what we use when we use k nearest neighbor. We say, how do I decide the number of neighbors, the optimal number of neighbors, by using cross validation? For instance, you will see here what I was saying earlier. This is k nearest neighbor on the banana data set that I showed you. If I use only one neighbor, he has error zero. But this error zero is not always your friend, right? So this error, he has error zero. But if I use all the data, he just gives me a constant function. This boom is there. So he gives me this function here. Well, it's not, you, you may say it's not quite constant, but he, he basically is, this is just a separation that he believed between the two labels. This separation is the fixed one that he has for these two labels. So, but then we're gonna decide to use cross validation in order to find the optimum number of neighbors. So, so big step number five has afforded a, an opportunity to now refine our data set. Now, to the question of my early caller, what happens is that at this step, if you were doing something involved with variable selection, where the predictor variables meant something to you and you realize the reason why my machine was not stable had to do with my predictor or my feature variable, this is the step where you will detect it. You will detect it here, maybe by studying multicollinearity in step number five, you'll detect those steps and maybe perform some PCA perform some inclusion of interactions or some other thing. Step number five is the one that reveals that to you because in step number four, you would have constructed an estimator and realized, gee, the variance of this estimator is absolutely off the roof. 
it's terrible. The variance is so high. And then so, and there's some very weird behavior from this. And then that's when you do it and you return and maybe modify your function space a little bit. Okay. So this is a little bit the summary of it that, you know, at the two extremes, you have underfitting where the function is very weak. It's always doing the same thing over and over again. Here, there's the optimum that you chose by cross validation. This one I chose by cross validation. And this one is the extreme that he always wants to have zero error. And of course, he's probably not going to predict as well as this function here. And so, so that's what step number five affords you. It's a refinement. That's the engineer in you. The engineers, engineers always have this thing about it's a process of refinement and all this stuff, you know. So anyway, is that making sense? Yeah. Um, oh, very good. And you can do that in classification here. You can do it in regression as well. This is an example in regression where you have my favorite function because this function is nasty sometimes. It's a tooth function. If you want it smooth, then you can use kernel regression. And you see here, we can use this you know, refinement to end up having the best fit for it. I think, no, you had a question. Sorry, I interrupted you. I, I apologize. Why do we cross validate if we already have an estimator function? Why do we cross validate? We cross validate because that function f hat that we just had, Noor, was not good. Like, let me explain something. Suppose you're doing linear regression and I gave you p and I gave you p predictor variable x1 up to xp or uh, even, even polynomial regression, whichever. I mean, it, it doesn't matter. Maybe suppose let, let's do polynomial. Hmm? Let's do polynomial. And you started with a polynomial of degree seven when my real polynomial is of degree three. What happens is that you're going to find your f hat. Your f hat that you had, if you start predicting, you will realize if you compare it, maybe let's suppose you're comparing polynomial to something else, and maybe somebody else tuned his stuff very well. You realize that your test error is consistently larger. So you go back and say, was it really degree seven? Why did I use degree seven anyway? Well, and you go back now and say, let's give ourselves a grid from degree one to degree maybe 10 and search within that using cross-validation to find the member that best captures the univariate function underlying my data. So in other words, you would have gotten a degree seven polynomial all right, but having a degree seven polynomial is not the end of the story. How good is it? How well is it when deployed? If you deploy it and it's performing poorly against the other, you go back to the drawing board. Maybe going back to the drawing board is that you skip your step number five. That's when you go back to your step number five and now decide, okay, let me not really do this very well. You know, just getting, uh, not getting beta hat is not enough. I want to check how good beta hat is. What's the variance of beta hat? What's the bias of beta hat? And checking the bias variance of beta hat shows me, ah, oh, my God, was not that good. I refine him by cross-validating and I get my polynomial of degree three and re-estimate my parameters from one to three and pick them. And I can go now and compete with people who already refined their own stuff in their house. So having F hat is not enough. You have to check how good F hat is. What's the bias? What's the variance of it? And then if it's too bad, you might have to do some refinement through cross validation. And you can do that also with variable selection in multiple linear regression. You can do that in a great neural networks indeed, right? When your neural networks are overfitting, when they're not competing well with the other machines, you go back and do some uh, early stopping, brain damage, and all those things, and you know, drop out, and all the different techniques that you use. You're using all these different techniques. Those are all different techniques for regularization because who told you that the number of neurons that you decided was right? Who told you the number of layers that you decided was right? So maybe the only way to find that out is to have a principle system for saying, this is my grid, this is my original grid. I know somebody asked a question last time, how do you design the grid? Well, the grid sometimes is a tricky. You have to have a little bit of experience sometimes. If you normalize, sometimes finding the grid is easier. And uh, But sometimes it takes a little bit of trying you know, to find out what is a reasonable grid in there. So, right, Nor, just having F hat is not enough. How good is F hat can make you have to do cross validation in order to find out, oh, maybe that F hat I had was not a good one. I needed to go in that class and cross validate to find the right one. Good? Yep. Excellent. And now we have, uh, I have only 10 minutes left, but I think I'm going to make it this time, Noah, believe me, because the rest of it is just a bunch of slides I'm going to show you real quick. So the question is, in fact, that's the question it leads up very clearly. Why do you have to cross validate? Because when you deploy, how good is it? We have this thing called the no fill theorem. What it really is the no fill theorem. Look at this problem, the four quarter. This is one of my favorite exercises to introduce my class in machine learning. Because this exercise also shows me something uh, that looks a little bit like uh, the VC dimension when you look at the VC dimension in, uh, you know, you know, 
in, in the plane, you know, this dimension of uh, separating hyperplane is, is three. But you see here, this is the same problem. And I'm asking different learning machines to solve this problem. Imagine what they're doing. This is what the trees do. This is what support vector machine does. Every single machine has a different way of approaching. This is so beautiful to see, though. I hope you guys can really see how cool this stuff is. And I'm not saying it's cool because I did it, though. No, that's not the reason. It's just because it shows us the ingenuity of different ways of approaching the same problem. Different people approaching the same problem are trying to find the ideal decision boundary. Maybe there is so-called the base, if we could call the base learner, the F star. The F star will sit somewhere. And all these guys are all trying to estimate F star. They're all trying to estimate F star. So when you sit in your house and build maybe this one, don't kid yourself in thinking nobody else is working. You have to come and compete with people in the common marketplace. And that's what I call the extrinsic predictive comparison that everybody builds his machine and then now we go and compare them in the absence of F star. The reason why step number six exists, my friends, is because we do not have F star. If we had F star, we could just say, I build my F hat, I'm just gonna compare them to F star. But F star is a theoretical construct. So the best way, the next best thing is to say, let's bring all the guys that are competing to solve this problem and see what different hypothesis spaces are doing on the same problem. And here I put nine different machines. And you can see nine different machines, frankly, are approaching this problem quite different. While well, some of them are totally lost. This guy, these two guys have no clue what's going on. They're really struggling. <laughs> these two guys are really out in left field. But Neural Networks is holding his own pretty well. He's uh, training error zero. I'm showing the training error, but in, in the other slide, I actually show the test error. So in a sense, step number six of my uh, wheels is basically showing us that in this beautiful arena, which I hope you guys will play in, there's so many different machines, so many different ingenuity. It makes me happy just to know how creative my brothers and sisters in this universe are. They come up with trees, the support vector machine, relevance vector, Gaussian process, K-nearest neighbor, K all kinds of multiple linear regression. They, they come up with all kinds of machines. So in the presence of a given problem, you become an expert at finding out which one to pick the best. And now, sometimes you may not have the luxury of just studying them theoretically. So what you do is, if you have computing power, you do this thing called stochastic holdout, SHO. Stochastic holdout means you ruffle your data so many times. Why do you do that? Because you know every copy of the test error you calculate is a random variable. So it could be an artifact. Somebody could have a small error in the replicate number 50 and have the largest error the rest of the time. So what you want then is to allow yourself to use randomness to your advantage in trying to compare a model extrinsically. So that's where you split your data into training and test set and you calculate this guy called a copy of the test set for the S replicate. And then you're gonna compute the average test error for that machine. It doesn't have to be the average, it could be the median, it could be whatever, I don't care. It could be some form of statistics that you compute on this test error. And the reason is because you can then you can then imagine that you have a lot of computing power and somebody says, you know what, Nora, I can build an LDA for you for this problem. I can build an SVM for you for this problem. I can build a tree for you for this problem. And then you'll be the one to judge when I build them after 100 replicate, which one tends to be have the smallest average or median test error. Okay, that's what it is. This, this is stochastic holdout, which is a normal practice that you see in literally all papers where people are building things that will give you some form of this, right? The, some people give it as a table. Some people give it as a graph, like here. This is a nice, interesting problem from UC Irvine where I'm comparing how many machines you want, two, three, four, five, six. I'm comparing the machines that you saw. And in this particular case, SVM seems to be claiming that he's a winner. And, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, he's a winner in many ways, right? Why is this so beautiful? This is beautiful because the box plot, by wow, a great man, he, he um, uh, Tukey gave us this very beautiful heritage that you know summarize. It gives you a sense of outliers, give you a sense of uh, the symmetry of the distribution and the wideness of it. So you see, here some of the machines uh, are more stable than others, and and this one tends to be the one that has the smallest median uh, test error. And this is a visually compelling comparison of many machines empirically, right? So in the absence of F star, at least you can compare them amongst themselves, like in a league, right? You're watching soccer, you, you compare them in the league and who is doing well. And this guy gives you not just a taste of the error, because this is a this is a good, decent estimate of the prediction error. You could call this greedy because I'm using the data set, but it's a decent way.
So, and I, I just did it for different data set. The banana data set that we just uh, encountered. Uh, of course, you see the reason why LDA is breaking his face in the banana data set. Uh, you saw that in the picture is because frankly, this is hard for him. Uh, he, he can't do it. So it's it's not linear. That, that, that decision boundary was definitely not linear. And then, um, and Canon is doing not too bad and uh, SVM is okay. And uh, Random Forest is around doing pretty, pretty decently. And uh, this is uh, my favorite data set, which is so nasty. All of them struggle on it, to be honest with you. This data, they struggle on it so bad. Uh, this is a Pima Indian diabetes data set. They, they struggle on it. It's, it's, a, it's a nasty data set. So, but you see, they're all, they're all really finding it hard. And I, I think if, if, you, if you constructed a, a test of hypothesis on, on, the, on the true test error, you probably will not be able to reject the null hypothesis. They're all struggling. So anyone who comes to you and says, well, you know, I have this thing of Pima Indian diabetes. That's great. You say, so please come on. Just, just get a life. You know, how this stuff is. Them, how can you tell that they're struggling? Is it because? Um, the because the maybe our star is large. Maybe this could just be nor because the true error may be just around this value. So, you know, the, and none of them, and the decision about maybe the true error, I mean, this problem is inherently difficult. You saw when we were trying to see the scatter plot, the pairwise scatter plot, the pairwise variable, none of them was showing us any meaningful separation, you know? So that's why that step number one is interesting, right? You you have a sense there, huh? You can almost foresee what's going to happen to you when you get to the last step. So in this could be an artifact, nor that R star itself is large, right? The R star, the, the smallest possible error may not be small. That's why one of the things we always teach in class that R star is not zero. In fact, sometimes I'll put it in my board. It's so funny. R star is not zero. People say, but it's the best machine. Yeah, it's a random process. Do you get it? We're calculating expected value of L, Y, F of X, right? We're calculating it's an expected value. Are there problems where R star is zero? Yes, they exist. In fact, there's so many theorems on situations where the R star is close to zero. But there are many interesting problems in life where because of the stochastic nature of the learning process, R star is non-zero. And in this case, R star might just be a large number. Or maybe some intelligent person watching this might come up with a machine that just poof brings this box plus down to nothing. And we say, well, how do you do it? Well, I detected what was hiding behind the Pima Indian diabetes data. Maybe, who knows? <laughs> or maybe add some new predictive variables to it that will enrich it. So this is where feature engineering, because feature engineering, you never stop really because it's 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 with you all. You may say, gosh, all the machines are struggling. So maybe what these guys, these people in the, in the diabetes community are measuring, they're not really telling us much. How about we go measure some other variables and add them to the system and redo? Maybe we should go back to Arizona and tell them, redo this study, but there's something that you did not measure that you should measure. Maybe that will bring back the error down. Or maybe these variables are enough, but the machines that we have, we need a new paradigm that will bring the error down. That's why I love this, Noah, because it's almost always an open-ended invitation to explore many different things, you know. So that's why I never miss my chance of showing this data set because I think that, you know, you have data set like this one, but then you come to this guy, the four-corner data set, which looks very scary, but, you know, there's some guys that just chew it away, you know, because the four-corner data set may look formidable, but the moment you check it out, you realize that, yeah, well, some guys can chew it out in prediction quite well. And this and this and that and different data set. Basically, you guys have the slides. You can go over this. And by the way, I mean, people who see this, they will see my contact. You can email me and say, I didn't get something about what you said. I'll, I'm open to that. You know, this is an opportunity for me to share this and open doors for uh, people with whom I can talk about this very fascinating concept. So this was in classification and uh, in the interest of time. In regression, you can compare. Sometimes you show. Sometimes I show it in the form of this box plot, which is my favorite way to show uh, results of classification because it doesn't matter if it's binary or whatever; it's, it's the same. But sometimes it's in the form of tables. Right? Tables are nice. You know, some people may want tables and maybe mark the best machines red and you know the one that's winning for this particular data set. And then, Nora, I hope I still have five minutes to finish my lecture. Right. So the last part of it. The last part of it is like uh, the wheel number seven. Wheel number seven is very interesting. Wheel number seven comes from this thing that I, I mean, this is, I mean, there are two quotes that I like to always use in relationship to wheel number seven is nothing is more practical than a good theory. And the first time I heard it, I thought that that sounds right. That sounds right? Yeah, that does. What it means is that they say the world makes a way for the person who knows where he's going. So in other words, if you could have a handle on really clearly 
maybe even just theoretically what F star is, so that when you're building F hat N, that you know how, what's the relationship between F hat N and F star. Frankly speaking, you will build very good machines. Let me repeat. If when you are constructing the machine, you have a good sense of F star, a good, a good, like in classification, we have a good sense of F star, right? So, like for instance, I'm going to flash back here and show you F star a little bit in the two cases that I showed last time. So when you're doing regression, when you're doing regression, you know, you know F star, you know who F star is under the square error laws. The only reason why you cannot compute F star is because you have trouble with the distribution. You don't know the distribution. The, the starting point is that we don't know the distribution of the data. And I said in a joke last time, if we knew the distribution of the data, I won't have a job. As a statistician, I won't have a job, right? Because there won't be anything for me to do. The only reason why we do this way, because we hypothesize, we do density estimation. For instance, if you're doing LDA, for instance, and um, or if you're doing linear regression, if you're doing LDA and you know the class condition or density, if, sorry, if you're doing a classification and you know that your distribution is Gaussian with the same covariance matrix, nobody can beat LDA because LDA becomes F star. Okay, so that's why I'm saying in both cases, we know theoretically what F star is. What I'm trying to communicate, my friends, and I think this is a very important message to take home. If we knew, at least theoretically, very well the contours of F star, we can do better at constructing the algorithms. We can do better at our scale conjugate gradient. We can do better at our stochastic gradient descent. Why? Because we'll have a blueprint. Like when you're building a house and you have the architect draw it for you, then if the drawing is good and the calculation of structure is good, then the house stands very well because the foundation is solid. The theoretical underpinning of the house, the material was calculated solidly. And that's where I believe that although in some communities, in some places, people give a bad press to wheel number seven, I still stand by my take that wheel number seven is very important because at the very least, it gives you a great sense of how good you're going to do. In fact, wheel number seven is a foundation of statistics. Let me explain. When you see elections and when you see the estimation of proportions of votes, you always hear this confidence in the vote, margin of error, da da da. But uh, all those are artifacts of being able to have wheel number seven tell you what to expect, right? It, it gives you a sense of what is F star. Even if it doesn't calculate it properly, though, it uses the language of probability to tell you the so called confidence bound. So this is what you saw in your undergraduate. I put this because I know you saw this picture at Nozim in your undergraduate statistics, the concept of a confidence interval. We do not know really what F star is. We do not know what R is, the true error is. But we can bound it with a probability. We can say with a probability of 95, 98, 90, 87. This is where error sits. And the beauty of it is that statistics has proven the test of time that when you do this confidence estimation right, you get a great sense of inference. What is happening in the wider population? What is happening to the true error? Okay, so, and that's what happens here. It two steps to wheel number seven. In wheel number seven, one of the steps is comparing F hat to F star. The other one is comparing F, F hat to F Diamond. The F diamond is the best in class H. F star is the universal best. And I was telling you, if you knew the distribution of X, then you can have F star. Like, for instance, when you do LDA, I don't know, many people are doing linear discriminant. I'm not talking about um, latent derivative allocation. I'm talking about linear discriminant analysis. You will find that sometimes if you are doing uh, classification, LDA will turn out to be the best machine. You say, oh my word, LDA is the best machine for this problem. It may be because your true class conditional density is Gaussian with an equal covariance matrix. In that case, you cannot beat him because thanks to the no Nofelian's theorem, he's lining up perfectly with the data generating process. So the comparison between F hat and F star has become favorable because the underlying distribution of the data lined up with this. So this is the first comparison, the comparison between F hat that you realize and F star. But the, and, and for instance, this is one thing that where the Kenya's neighbor, it looks like a very simple machine, but it enjoys a very nice relationship with R star. But the last part to finish this class is this thing called VC dimension. And I'll do this and I'll be done so that 
I don't exaggerate. I don't overstate my welcome. Um, that would what... never happen, Professor. <laughs> <laughs> No. So no, but the thing is that you know I, I'm just I'm just excited to talk about wheel number seven because you know there are two things at play here, Noor. There's the there is the universal best, right? The universal best, which you can only realize if you knew the distribution of the data, and that's where statisticians and computer scientists come up with this. Let's assume that the data is Gaussian, or let's assume the data come from some distribution. If your assumption is correct, then the machine you build using that class condition of density will be unbeatable. In fact, one of the first exercises in my class is I actually cook up the data using a known thing and I say, show me who is the best machine. They say, but Prof, LDA is better. I say, of course, why do you think that's the case? <gasps> oh, maybe the data is Gaussian. All right. So you can go with all kinds of sophisticated algorithm. They won't beat it because he's sitting right there in the distribution. But the next thing is this thing called the VC dimension or the VC theory. And what, what really is it really? I'm gonna give you a very short, simple explanation of this. It comes from something similar to this confidence interval that we showed. In this confidence interval, you're comparing X bar to mu. So you're trying to find out how good of an estimator of mu is X bar. How good of an estimator of mu is X bar. In the same way, what happens is that in practice, the only error you can calculate by hand, well, not by hand, the only error you can realize from the data is this empirical risk. And the question you're asking yourself is really, the empirical risk can be fooled, couldn't it? Yes, it can be fooled. You can just, you know, make it go to zero by just memorizing. So I want to be able to compare the realized error to the true error. But the problem is I don't know the true error. So how do I go about this problem? And that's where you use the same wisdom that you use in constructing confidence interval. So in the past, you have here mu and you have here x bar. And you're trying to see the distance between x bar and mu. And you want to be able to say that most of the time, the distance between x bar and mu is vanishingly close to zero. That's what this bound is saying. Do you want to say most of the time, the distance between the, the empirical risk realized and the true risk is very small because you know you cannot say it always because of randomness. So that's why you use probabilistic bounds. And this kind of union here, because you want it to be uniform, you don't want it to be just for one, you want it to be throughout the whole space of the functions. Okay, so this bound that you've seen so many times, I'm going to show you the bound and I'm going to explain exactly where, where it comes from. This bound that you've seen here is the most celebrated result in this field, right? In the field, when you see this, it says, this is a true error that I never know. And this is the one that I do calculate. This is the capacity, new here is the VC dimension, is the capacity of the function class. And I'm saying the true error, which I don't know, is bounded above by this quantity. And what does that mean? The true error cannot be larger than this. So in other words, if this number is small, then I'm very happy. It's the same as saying if I build a 95% confidence interval and the width of my confidence interval is small, I'm happy because I know I'm precise. The size of this is a measure of the precision. Hmm? It's a measure of precision. This guy is a measure of accuracy, as it were. This is, we call it coverage. I mean, you, in confidence interval language, we call this the measure of the coverage. How often am I confident in the size of this? discrepancy between my true error and the one that I realized. And what I was saying earlier is if you can make this guy small, then you're in business. And that brings me to the VC dimension. So what the key question here, stand for again? yeah, there's a question. There's a question. Yeah, go ahead. What does eta stand for again? Is the VC dimension. Eta here is the capacity of the function class. And I'm going to explain a little bit in simple terms what that is, right? So the VC dimension came from something nor. What happens is that if the number of functions for which you're calculating R hat is finite, then the problem is very simple. The problem becomes a very simple, you know, calculation of some, um, you know, chain of bounds and you can use some very classical things, you know. So in if script H, right, I hope you guys are listening. Is script H the set of functions from which you're searching is finite. So the best function is in there in that class, and you are just using the data to search that function class. If that guy is finite, 
then you don't need the VC that I mentioned. You just call that guy M. Maybe that number of function is M. Maybe let's say there's M functions in there. Sometimes I used to call it H because, well, H, H. <laughs> so if that guy is fine, that no problem. The bound is that I didn't show the bound here, but because we don't have enough time. If that guy is fine, you can show, you can read that bound. If you want me to send you the slides with that bounds when this is fine, I'll send it to you right away. But if it's infinite, as it is the case most of the time, right? If you're searching the space of all linear separating hyperplanes, if you're searching this space of whole linear, this guy has infinitely many planes in there. The infinitely many guys that can separate in two classes, infinitely many. So you cannot put infinitely many here. If this is infinite, we're in trouble. If the VC dimension is infinite, then your question from last time comes in, Noor, then you don't have strong learnability. Learnability has something to do with VC dimension or some measure similar to it that, that, that you know, you don't need an infinite amount of data to find that element. And that's where this picture that you've seen in many places, uh, where is it? Oh, that picture didn't make it into my slides. Oh, what happened? Oh, here. Oh, I was afraid that the picture didn't make it in my slide. So this is a concept of shattering. So I, I'm probably eating away on my time right now. So. This is a sample. This is um, this is a situation where you have a sample of size three, and you can construct a grand total of eight different separating hyperplanes on it, right? Because it's two to the power of three. So the VC dimension is basically just saying, what is the sample size? What is the largest sample size such that? In the class that you chose, in this case, the class of separating hyperplanes, we, we don't have any quadratic here. This is just planes. We're just drawing lines. What is the largest sample size such that for any given data set, you can find a labeling such that at least one of the members separates with a zero error? Now, this is too long to explain. Think about it this way. Think about this this way. If this number is not finite, I, I'm going to explain this dimension in the other way. If the number is not finite, what it means is that every time you can never really stop searching. There's always, a, it's, if, if it's, if it's not learnable. This thing is like a moving target. It, it's constantly growing. It's constantly growing and you can never stabilize. There's not something stabilizing that you can learn. So you need a finite VC dimension in order to be learnable. It's almost like some idea to think about is the number of parameters. So if your class becomes non-parametric, most of the non-parametric classes have infinite VC dimension. Right? So they don't have that strong learnability. Because you can always find, like in the one nearest neighbor, this guy, this machine, this machine that is extremely always, this one nearest neighbor machine, he always has infinite VC dimension. Because if you give him a sample of size n, he can always give you a zero error. Any sample of size n, infinite, he can give you a zero error. So think about it as a capacity of the function class. And what does that mean? It means this is what can be learned. So what is the limiting? What is the limitation of this? How big can it get? You know, and it's, if you think... <laughs> How big can it get? Like, like I said, if you have a parametric class, then you're going to have the number of parameters being something akin to that VC dimension. Okay? So if you have a finite number of, of functions in your class, then that bound is easy. If you have an infinite uh, number of uh, function in your class, then you have to define this concept, which is actually, if you play around with it, you'll realize it's actually very intuitive, actually. It's, uh, at first, it sounds very baffling. What is this concept of shattering? A shattering. You know, so... Yeah, so that's 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 exactly the VC dimension. Anyway, just by way of a summary, I just want to summarize for you guys to say that in this business of statistical machine learning, you really do need them both. Theory without practice is empty, but practice without theory is blind. If all we did was to just mess around with the VC dimension and have this nice bound and never really have algorithms or data to build them up, then what good would that serve? I mean, if you're a theoretician and that's what you earn, you keep doing, that's fine. But if you're a practical data scientist and you really want to be able to build models that people use to improve their lives, to get nice apps and to do self-driving cars and do better um, 
air traffic control or other things that are useful in our daily lives, then practically, I think you should, you should always have a beautiful marriage and interplay between the theory and practice. The theory that practice is empty and practice with that theory is blind and can be, and can be very dangerous. And, and can be very dangerous because when you when you have an appreciation for the fact that this guy has a VC dimension at infinity, it's still a very interesting machine, though. It, it, it does a lot of good things. People have studied it ad nauseum. It just doesn't have the so-called strong learnability. And for instance, when you know that all the hyperplane has a VC dimension of P plus one, you can almost come here and have a good sense of your machine even before you build it. You, you can come here and plug that number and have a good sense of, hmm, what do I expect this to be? So when you build a machine, you feel comfortable in the same sense, like you say, my confidence interval is this for this mu. My confidence interval for the proportion of voters for this candidate is this. So that's the beauty of wheel number seven. So there you go, my friends. I hope that uh, I have not really wasted your time in sharing some insights about what I have come to call the seven wheels of uh, statistical machine learning. So if Nork indulge me with a couple of questions, I'll appreciate it. But if we run out of time, I'll understand that too. Thank you. Sure. Um, so question I have for you, Professor, um, is about confidence intervals. Yes, um, please. What are some situations in which doing a p-test aren't exactly appropriate, and what tests can we do instead? A, um, if if you are in a situation where um, using a confidence using a so you you're talking about hypothesis testing, right? You you're talking about inference, right? Yeah, yeah. So you're talking about inference where I have a proportion p that I'm comparing uh, to a p zero, a hypothesized p zero. And then, um, and uh, you know, maybe an upper sided test. Uh, somebody hypothesized that p is greater than p zero, and the other one is uh, hypothesized p is less than or equal to p zero, and you can construct that test. Yeah, and and you're saying you you're asking when you lose normality. I, I don't think I understood the question very well. Um, I guess the question is um, back when I was a young stats student. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. There was sometimes talk that the p test isn't always the the most efficient way to go about hypothesis testing. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was typically the only uh, hypothesis test that we'd learn. Ah, I yeah. see. I think I understand your question, Nora. You're asking that in sometimes what they did was they assumed that n times p zero was large, and n times one minus p zero was large, and they can use approximate normality, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, you don't have to use approximate normality. You can sit with the binomial. You can do a pure, pure, original binomial, pure, exact. We call that the exact test. You can do that. It's just the reason why people prefer people well, whenever they can. They move quickly to the normal test. I mean, the test that assumes that n times p0 is, is greater than 10 and n times 1 minus p0 is greater than 10 is because it affords them the so-called central limit theorem for proportions so that they can have nice quantile with z and uh, because it's not a discrete distribution. But in fact, um, I think that this is what Noor is referring to so, so that everyone understands what she's talking about, that in this confidence interval, we're using z and Noor was asking, do you always have to use Z? No, you don't always have to use Z. As a matter of fact, you can use the quantile of a binomial distribution, nor you don't have to use it. This is in the case where this test is valid when N uh, is when N times P zero is large and N times weight. So, so that's when this test is valid. Uh, but sometimes the coverage may not be exact if, uh, if um, the conditions are not met. In that case, you have to use the binomial, the binomial quantiles here. Yeah. I think I, I, I'd like to suspect that that's the question you're asking. That do you always have to use Z? No, you don't have to use Z. Sometimes it could be the binomial quantile. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so it's a question. Um, mm -hmm. And then we have another question about VC dimensions. Yes, please. Um, I want I want those questions. <laughs> do we only ever use them for classification problems? Say that again. Do we only ever use VC dimension for classification problems? Oh, no, no. They are the, the, VC dimension is very interesting, right? It's, um, you, you don't have to use it only for classification. People have tried to de define VC dimension in all kinds of settings, right? The, the most natural place to define it, though, is classification. It's a very natural place where the idea was born, and they tried to extend it to many other places where the idea is not just to separate uh through labels and, and they, they try to construct the vc dimension for all kinds of uh, of a kind of problem and um it, it is not trivial like here you see i have a bound here 
uh, the person asking this question ask a very beautiful question. This is bound here that I <clears throat> that I um that I got from my uh, from my colleague uh, David Bound uh, David Banks, who is also my supervisor here at uh, here at uh, Sam C. Duke, and uh, that you can construct. similar situation with uh, similar measures um, outside. But the, yeah, but you can imagine construct VC types for class, for uh, beyond, uh, that, that's what my first, that's what this phrase is basically saying, uh, that VC type bounds can be constructed uh, in, uh, in a regression analysis. Yeah, it's it's just a matter of coming comfortable with what that represents, right? It's it's clunky to come up with that, but it coming up with ways to really rephrase that in a sense. And it's an exercise that people indulge for so many years. They started playing kind the kind of VC dimension for trees, VC dimension for random forests, VC dimension for boosting, VC dimension because they wanted to be able to they wanted to be able to come up with the same bounds, right? I have a function class in which I'm searching stuff. Can I come with bounds similar to this one that Vadnik had for any hypothesis space? So. Um, that was all the questions uh, that both me and the audience had. Um, I don't know if you have any final remarks for the audience. My, fi my final remarks to my audience is that I really appreciate, you know, being given this opportunity to talk about this paper. I did not stay totally faithful to the paper from the first line to the last because I wanted to use this opportunity to tell the story of the seven reels, which um, I don't call them that in the paper, but this afforded me an opportunity to share with you guys some of the ways that maybe some of you in your practice of statistical machine learning, you will find this to be um, to be a um, reasonable way, a reasonable framework to think about it. I'm not saying you should think about it that way. Don't get me wrong, but I'm saying that this is my this is my uh, this is my suggestion that this is some of the things that happen. That uh, there's a theoretical aspect of this. There is a uh, there is the so-called extrinsic empirical comparison, which we always do. You see in all, literally all papers uh, that involve data, some form of tables or box plots that are comparing different machines, basically different hypothesis spaces. And there's always step number five. It's difficult for me to see somebody who will build a machine without tuning it, refining it. And there's an aspect of uh, estimation in there. What my parting remarks for you guys is this is a very potent field. It's so rich in so many things like, uh, you know, VC bound is a good way to uh, talk about the relationship between the generalization error and the realized one, which is the empirical error. But maybe in the audience, there are people that are smart enough to come up with some things that are slightly less convoluted in explaining, like the VC dimension is nice, but there might be some other ways to explain this that are that are maybe different ways to measure the capacity of a function class that are more straightforward. And again, I'm not saying anything in Vavnik and Chebunenkis, but you see there's Radomir complexity. There's so many different ways that people measure the capacity of function class. I just want to encourage all of you to truly always, you know, be creative, be open to the fact that you could be the one that will create the next machine that help us solve some of the problems. So it's a very important field, is rich with so many opportunities from wheel number one to wheel number seven. There's so many ways in which you can create. And I hope that this is just the beginning of my uh, of my journey with you guys, that uh, maybe some of you will trace me and ask questions and we could form friendships and discuss this very beautiful topic. So those are, uh, you know, be creative. That's what I'm saying, be creative. And um, don't forget the interplay between uh, theory and practice. And don't forget my multinomials. You need applications, you need computations, you need the uh, methodology and you need theory. So you need those four, you always need those four, which is basically a summary of you need theory and, uh, and practice, you need both. We need both. Amazing, so I wanna thank you, Professor Erdis, for joining us today. Um, we always thoroughly enjoy your talk. Mm -hmm. And I want to thank you guys, the audience, for joining us uh, to see more free content like this or even um, the first part of this lecture. Um, visit ai.science and log in to access slides from this and other sessions and many more. Um, also, make sure to smash that like button if you like this video um, and subscribe to our YouTube channel, um, which is called ML Papers Explained, to get, notifi to get notified about all the live sessions and other free content we publish. Um, I'm Noor Fahmi, and I hope you have a lovely day. Bye, guys. Thank you, Noor. Night. Thank you, guys.